Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Sam Humphrey, and I'm delighted that you've chosen to join today's webinar. Today, we're going to be talking about how can you prove that you're an ethical coach, which in itself is quite an interesting question. I'm going to go through a number of things today, and hopefully we'll have some time to have some questions and answers at the end. So let me start with why I'm qualified to speak about this topic. So I've been coaching now for nearly 25 years. Uh, few people have actually had uh, the experience of seeing coaching do harm, which is sadly one of, one of the credits that I can claim. The experience of that was working on a leadership programme where a group of internal coaches, very well intentioned and absolutely trying to work in an ethical way, ended up, because they weren't clear about the boundaries of their work, um, pushing people really hard. The learning from that experience was that we needed to make sure that the coaches that we had absolutely were fit for purpose and were able to exercise duty of care for both themselves and for the people they were coaching. As a result of that, I put together a, an assessment process for anybody who wanted to get on the Unilever preferred supplier list of coaches. The group that I looked after were the top 250 leaders in the business, so quite a senior group of people. So coming up with an assessment process, and it was an assessment, <laughs> resulted in a full day of activities. Because nobody was really doing much of that sort of thing at the time, it got quite a lot of attention. It became a bit of a gold standard about how one would go about assessing and selecting coaches to work with your most senior people. The landscape of coaching was also very different then, so supervision was still a fairly new phenomenon. That said, um, we ended up with a group of absolutely fantastic coaches who did really exceptional work within the business. I ended up doing quite a lot of talk, talks about this topic and my opening line very frequently would be that most companies have a procurement process for buying toilet rolls, yet very few of them have a procurement process for buying the very people who have very detailed, complex questions for their clients and spend a lot of time helping them explore some really, really important topics. Anyway, let's ca carry on with um, talking about this subject of ethics. Um, the other reason I'm qualified to talk about this topic is I was one of the first 25 people to go through a master's in executive coaching, and I had the joy of being trained by some of the absolute titans of the coaching industry, people like Dr. Bruce Peltier, Ernesto Spinelli, Mike Van Oudshorn, um, all amazing, amazing people who really did help establish and grow the coaching profession. David Lane, a big part of the EMCC formation. So lots of people in those days who were absolutely the pioneers of coaching. I also, as a result of the Unilever experience, had a lot of questions that have hung about my uh, coaching practice for a long time, particularly to do with how coaches are ethical in how they do their work. So if you fast forward 25 years from that experience, I decided that I would do a doctorate. I thought it important to do uh, some empirical, get some empirical evidence to support the hypotheses I was running in my head. I'm going to talk about that today um, uh, so that you have uh, an awareness of what some of the evidence showed. Absolutely fascinating. If I also think about as, as a coach, what I champion is high quality coaching and supervision by working with coaches and clients to develop clarity on the goals, the guides and guards that demonstrate duty of care. I think as a sector, coaching has a very big responsibility to give that due attention. So my goal for the session today is as follows. Uh, I hope that by the end, you will all leave with a better understanding of what duty of care means to you as a coach and to your clients. I hope you leave with some actionable ways to develop duty of care and to develop your ethical consciousness. 
Thirdly, I hope that you will leave with at least three ways that you can demonstrate duty of care for you, that will enable you to distinguish yourself to your clients. So coaching is becoming an ever increasingly crowded market. So ways of differentiating, I think, are, are becoming ever more important. I'm also hoping that I might leave with a few volunteers who are prepared to work alongside me and incorporate some uh, re research I'm doing. Um, so I'm really hoping that for those of you who are willing and able, you might be prepared to get in touch and help me with some research I'm doing around ethical consciousness. So how we're going to do that in terms of the roadmap for today is we're gonna cover three things. We're gonna explore duty of care, we're going to work through my research. And thirdly, I'm going to talk to you about what the ethical differentiators are. So let's start with duty of care. So what do we mean by duty of care? Well, as is the case with most terms in coaching, there's very rarely one absolute answer to that question. But what I'm going to invite you to do is really think about, well, what does duty of care mean to me and the stakeholders in the work that I do? So if we take that one step further, I'm going to offer you this matrix for you to start to explore and unpack what ethical evidence you have for duty of care. If I take as an example, confidentiality, every coach will ensure that they maintain and explain confidentiality to their coaching clients. Fantastic. But what does that actually mean? That's a very big word that has a lot sitting under it. So how can you ethically evidence that you have confidentiality in terms of looking after yourself as a coach? Lots of coaches I supervise often think that when they contract on confidentiality, it's all about the client. Well, as a coach, that confidentiality needs to be reciprocated so that if you say something that's maybe a, a bit personal or you share an example of something that your client knows that your confidentiality is as important as theirs. Thinking about the confidentiality for your coaching client, well again saying something is completely confidential that's that is a very very big ask. That means you don't talk to anybody ever at all in any way about um, working with that client, which would mean that if you see somebody at um, reception, when you go and meet a client, you can't say who you're going to see, because they, if they know you're a coach, then you, you'll be giving away that you're going to see them and coach them. So this stuff does actually count. It's really important for you to think about it. The coaching sponsor, sometimes that might be the line manager or it might be the chair or the um, uh, managing partner of a firm um, or it might be the chief exec. Mm -hmm. Thinking about who is sponsoring the coaching, who the paying client is, if you like, is a good way to think about this. And what duty of care do you have to them as a coach? That's an interesting question. Also thinking about the coaching custodian, I tend to think of the coaching custodian as the person who makes all the coach ha coaching happen in the organisation. They might have budget um, to spend on coaching, they might not be the budget holder, but they're the people who essentially bring in the coaches and deploy them throughout the organisation. And then finally, there is, of course, a duty of care to the coaching sector. The most obvious way is signing up to a code of ethics. Mm -hmm. However, there's lots of other things that you might want to think about in terms of what your duty of care is as a coach to those different stakeholders. As you'll see on this matrix, some of them will be explicit and known, and some of them might be implied or unknown requirements. One that comes up quite frequently for coaches is the expectation around giving feedback or check-ins to either the coaching custodian or the coaching sponsor. That has to be really tightly contracted. Otherwise, you might be completely blowing apart what you've said to the client about confidentiality. So really thinking about how you exercise duty of care around all these different stakeholders is a really, really worthwhile activity. Okay, let's move on to my doctoral research. So 
Increasingly, um, from my experience um, 25 years ago, having seen coaching do harm, I got very curious about, well, how do we make sure that we're working ethically? So I know none of the coaches that I saw were determined to do harm, quite the reverse. So I got very curious around, well, supervision seems to be the main place that people would take some of their ethical dilemmas. Over recent years, the professional coaching body how bodies have mandated that supervision uh, should be taken up by all coaches. Now, I'm not very good at being told what to do at the best of times, but I also don't like being told what to do without understanding why. I completely understand that supervision, and I'm also a supervisor, mm -hmm. I completely understand that supervision absolutely aids and supports the learning and development of a coach. But I don't see why that would be the only way that my learning and development can be supported, because it's not. There are many other ways that I can learn and develop as a coach. So I'm curious as to why a professional body and some buyers of coaching mandate that coaches need to be in supervision. So this got me thinking, well, what do people think happens in supervision? What do they think is being worked on? So the question that I had um, for my doctorate research was, what does an experienced business coach work on in supervision to satisfy their own expectations and those of their stakeholders? So covering quite a lot of people. The mechanics of my research involved uh, interviewing with four different stakeholder groups. First of all, interviewing and speaking to some coaches. Obviously, I wanted to understand what their expectations of supervision were. Supervisors. So what's their expectation about what a, an experienced business coach will bring to supervision? The professional bodies. What do they think a, a master practitioner brings to supervision? What are their expectations around that? And finally, buyers of coaching. So across Europe and in the US, there are some organizations that have this as a mandatory requirement that a coach must be in supervision. So if buyers want coaches in supervision, what are they expecting they work on? That's what I wanted to find out. So I ran some focus groups and I also did some uh, semi-structured interviews in order to collate and analyze the, the data around that particular question. The findings fell into three main categories. The first was the answer to the question. So what do those different four stakeholder groups expect a, uh, an experienced business coach to bring to supervision? And basically the answer was anything, anything they want. The answers ranged from things like business development, uh, fee structure, transference and counter-transference, blind spots, using a particular psychometric or coaching tool, um, thinking about uh, how you contract, thinking about how to market, what IT system is the best for um, running coaching assignments. The list was very long and very broad. So that got me thinking, well, that's interesting. If I am being mandated to bring anything I want to supervision, interesting. The second finding that came out was about purpose of supervision and essentially this was that there isn't a clarity of purpose for supervision in the market there are lots and lots of different supervision models not quite as many as coaching models but there are a lot of supervision models and frameworks that that are used the research out there is more about what the mm -hmm. tools are the frameworks are but they don't really say much about when and why they should be used so there is a bit of, here's a supervision model, use it whenever you want, wherever you want, with whoever you want, which again, gets me curious. Then the third main finding was about expectations. So across those four groups, there were of course some similarities and some, some overlap in terms of what they expected, but there were also some polar opposite views, absolutely opposite ends of the same spectrum. So Understandably, each component group had a view about what different things should be brought to supervision. Buyers, a lot of the buyers that I interviewed suddenly realized that they didn't actually know what the supervision was there for, nor what they would be covering. 
when pressed with questions, they did start to think, well, we never specify what we want covered in supervision. It's kind of seen as the quality assurance, if you like, of, of coaching. But probably we ought to put a little bit more thought into what we expect coaches in supervision to be doing and to not be doing as well. So those were the three um, uh, um, findings that came out of my research. And there were also some key recommendations, which I'm going to go through in turn. These are the things that will help you think about how you can differentiate yourself ethically. The recommendations from the research were, first of all, have some stakeholder dialogue. Talk to the different constituents involved in a coaching assignment to make sure that you have clarity on what they are expecting and not expecting around the ethical requirements and expectations of the coaching. In my research, some buyers were very clear that they expected the coach to only talk about the clients that they were coaching in their organisation. Another coaching buyer said that they would not expect them to talk about their, their clients because they wouldn't want the supervisor to know who was being coached in their organisation. So you can see just from that small example how important it is that people really are clear and talk to the stakeholders about what's expected so that you have clarity from the outset. The second recommendation was to make sure that you as coach are fit for purpose and that also your supervisor is fit for purpose. When I was training to be a coach, the framework that I was encouraged to look at is the one that you can see on the screen now. So think about yourself in three different areas as a coach. There's your inputs, your throughputs and your outputs. So your coach inputs are basically who you are as a coach. And that's everything about you. It's how you show up. It's your values, your beliefs, your education, your experience, your training, everything, your personality, everything that makes you who you are as a coach. The second thing is to think about your throughputs. That is how you coach. So all the logistical elements the theory that you apply, the frameworks, tools and techniques that you use, the logistics, including things like, are you a coach that works over six sessions, 12 sessions, half day blocks? Do you work in privacy? Do you go for walks with your client? Do you work with groups? Do you work with one one on one? Do you co-coach? thinking about all those logistical things that make up how you actually deliver your coaching service. Then the third area is what's the purpose of your coaching? And you can cut this in many different ways. It could be that you think about the population you coach. So maybe you only coach senior executives, or it might be that you coach uh, women returning from maternity leave, or that you coach high potential um, people, or you coach in a particular sector. Or that you might have a topic that you coach on, that you coach for confidence, or you coach for leadership, or you coach for business development. So getting some clarity around what you are, who you are, and how you coach is a really good start point. And once you have a sense of that, you can use this framework to think about what you need to get from supervision. What is it that you need to work on? So for instance, you might say, well, I've never actually done any work on my values. So I would really like to do a deep dive and understand a bit more about who I am as a coach from a values perspective. So that would lead you to making sure that you got a supervisor who's able to do that work with you. If you wanted to look at how you coach and maybe thinking about how you set up your website or market your coaching, then that would point you, maybe not to supervision, it might point you to finding a mentor or employing a consultant to help you with that. So what you're trying to do with this framework is really make sure that it's balanced and that it makes sense and that it's congruent. Exactly the same framework I recommended should, should apply for supervisors. So supervisors need to think about who they are as a supervisor, how they supervise and what the purpose of it is. Because if you're able to articulate, articulate that very clearly, then you'll be able to find the clients that you will do your best work with. So a real meeting of the minds. 
The reason that that was so important for me in terms of a recommendation is if the first answer is is absolutely the case that I can take anything as a coach I want to supervision. As a supervisor, that makes me really question how on earth, from an ethical point of view, I can be qualified to supervise everything because I can't. So I need to have some clarity about what I can and can't supervise so that I can work eth ethically with my clients. The third recommendation from the research was to consider self-supervision as a very serious and real part of your coaching practice. <laughs> what was really interesting about this when I was doing the literature review is that in therapeutic worlds, self-supervision is very much encouraged. And from the moment you start as training as a therapist, self-supervision less so in coaching. It's not something that many coaches talk about very openly. There's not a lot of activity around this, although a lot do it. So thinking about self-supervision, I think, is, is also a really important part of a coach's practice. You, I'm sure, will be familiar with um, Sean's uh, statements around reflection in action and reflection on action. The other one that I, um, practitioner that I found really interesting was the um, psychologist Patrick Casement, who talked about hindsight, insight and foresight, and that paying attention to all of those in terms of how you self-supervise is a good thing. So hindsight, he means by that thinking about work you've done, the work you've completed, a session you've had with the client. What can you glean from that when you reflect on what you did? Foresight is thinking about what you're going to do in an upcoming super, um, uh, coaching session or the conversation you might have or how you might plan it. The insight part that he talks about is another uh, topic of great interest to me, which is in the moment. So it's Sean's reflection on action or inaction. Uh, in the moment, how does a coach course correct? How do you think about in the moment of coaching, how it's going and what you need to do in order to move the coaching in the right direction and support your client in the best way possible? I'm really interested in that. Uh, and I'll come back to, uh, to that in a bit more detail later. So the case for self-supervision, uh, a lot of it, as I said, is written about in the therapeutic world. So the view is that where coaches practice self-supervision, they can get more value from any uh, formal supervision that they have, whether that's one to one or in a group, because they'll come better prepared. They'll have a much uh, greater degree of clarity on what they want to bring to supervision. So they're able to derive more value from the session itself. The second case for self-supervising is, is a way of ensuring that you look after yourself as coach, self-care, because you're reflecting and thinking about the work you're doing and the impact that it's going to have on you. Thirdly, there's a duty of care element to self-supervision, thinking about all the different constituents in a coaching assignment and reflecting on those, planning for those and thinking about the conversations you're having are all a strong case for why it's important for coaches to self-supervise. So how does one self-supervise? Well, there are lots of different ways that um, people can, can do this. Um, I ran a webinar for the ICF um, uh, in New York chapter, and uh, we had a group of about 60 coaches there, and we shared in breakout groups different ways that we could do self-supervision, or in fact already do do self-supervision. And these were some of the key ones that came up. So journaling, mindfulness practices, that's particularly important, I think, in terms of being present and doing that in the moment course correction. Shadow coaching is a way of doing some self-supervision. Self Meditation, videoing or recording your um, coaching session so that you can reflect back on the exchange that happened at the time. And rehearsal. So having a rehearsal with, either with a supervisor or you can rehearse a particular technique or an approach that you want to do. Mm. The other um, area that um, uh, has a lot of attention around self-supervision is a product that I use called Me My Coach. 
This is an online diagnostic tool which supports coaches work through in a very structured way coaching assignment sessions. This is an area where I'm doing some research um, and this is where I'm hoping I might be able to get some volunteers um, to help with this research. Me My Coach gives a framework to coaches to really think about how they're approaching their coaching sessions and they can reflect on them and plan for them. But the bit that I'm really interested in is how coaches do that course correction piece. As we all know, the EMCC have um, a set of competencies. Very few coaches will be able to hold all those co competencies in their head during a coaching session and be able to tick them off and uh, uh, in the moment and say, yes, I'm doing all of those. The Me My Coach framework gives a much simpler framework to think about this, and it does map onto all the EMCC competencies. So what I wanted to uh, do in my research is find out whether or not using Me My Coach increases a coach's ethical consciousness. So if anybody is interested in that, please contact me at the email address you'll see at the end, and I would love to speak to you more about that. So my goal for this session was to leave you all with a better understanding of what duty of care means to you as a coach and to your clients. And I hope that you can see that duty of care is a much more expansive topic than perhaps those three words initially imply. I also hope that you're able to leave with some actionable ways to develop your duty of care and ethical consciousness. And finally, I hope that my research has helped inform some ways that you'd be able to demonstrate duty of care and distinguish yourself from other coaches. In a world where confidentiality and privacy and data protection is so important, this topic is only ever going to get more and more scrutiny. I want to thank you all very much for your time and attention today and look forward to hearing what questions you have that we can explore in this next session. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. San. So thanks for your speech about duty of care and the ability of uh, maintaining confidentiality in the ethical ways of being a coach. Yes, yeah, so uh, let's start the Q&A part. So I, I noticed uh, in your slides, uh, you need volunteers to support your data. So I was wondering uh, which kind of uh, people are you aiming for? Uh, it, it should be coaches or just the normal people? So coaches. Um, coaches only? Uh, yes. So oh, okay. coaches. Coaches who are uh, working with some clients and perhaps people who are just starting out as coaches. I think that's where this online tool can really start to develop ethical consciousness. Okay, great. I will uh, convey your messages to okay. those uh, audience. Yeah, so I collect several uh, questions from the audience. So uh, one audience is very curious about your choice of um, be uh, of the coaching and supervision major because there's no coaching supervision major in China. So how do you develop the awareness of being a coach, and how do how do you, uh, do that uh, decision making? Yeah. Okay. So um, a lot of the uh, universities in Europe and the US now offer coaching masters and coaching doctorates. Mm -hmm. And um, these can be done long distance. So you can absolutely sign up to do some of those if you would like to do that. The other thing that can be very useful is to really extend your reading on the subject. So all the different masters and doctorate courses will have some reading lists that they will certainly the master's uh, programs that they would recommend you read. Um, and the EMCC itself also has a fantastic um, uh, repository of research and of information and of papers that have, have been written. So there's a lot of data that you can access in order to really broaden your knowledge and understanding of coaching and supervision without having to do a formal course. Okay, so uh, so you start. Um, so. Uh, before you start your doctorate or um, 
your master, you uh, you have uh, touched uh, and know the EMCC? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's the reason. Okay. Ah, uh, 刚刚第一个问题是，嗯，有观众对于就是啊，散、uh, 博士的啊、uh, 专业选择非常好奇，为什么他会选择啊、uh, 硕士博士都会啊、uh, 读教练督导专业？嗯，就是因为啊、呃，就是其实在美啊、呃，在中国其实就很少有这样的专业，就是教练专业或督导专业。但其实啊、呃、，Sam 啊、呃、博士回答，在美国有很多所大学，其实他会提供啊、呃、关于啊、呃、督导啊、呃、还有教练的一些学位啊、呃。那有些是长期的，有些是短期的，但是它非常的实用，而且在这个过程中，它可以就是非常大大量的训练到你的啊、呃、阅读的能力。啊啊，第三呢，主要是因为就是他在就是呃、啊、计划学位之前接触到了欧洲导师与教练协会啊，就是 EMCC 啊，他就是觉得他很热爱这份事业，然后并且他在就是呃、啊、接触这个过程中了解到 EMCC 其实背后有一个非常多的宝藏库，他会提供非常多的文章材料，然后能够非常迅速的扩大自己对于啊教练、督导等等的理解，所以说他综合这些因素、这些资源啊，他决定就是啊继续啊啊深造。Yeah, thank you very much. 啊，而且刚刚就是啊啊 ，Doctor Sam 他在自己的啊嗯学位的就是追求过程之中，就是在读博士学位的过程当中啊，他就是写了一篇就是非常就是啊写了一篇论文。然后他现在目前正在做一个关于就是啊教练的一项就是研究，所以他需要很多的志愿者啊教练志愿者或者是导师志愿者啊愿意参与到这项就活动之中。所以如果啊您对这个活动感兴趣啊，可以就是联系我们的工作人员。Uh, the second question is um, the you mentioned the purpose of your coaching and your supervision. So um, the audience uh, think about the adaptability. So how can we find a coach or a mentor or a supervision who fits for us? Hmm. So um, I don't know if this applies in China. Uh, however, in Europe and the US, uh, there are some supervisors who are listed on the EMCC websites. So that's one place that you can look. Um, I think trying to find somebody who is qualified, um, somebody who has some experience is important. And the most important thing is to think about what you want to get from supervision and what you're um stakeholders want from supervision so one of the common themes from the research men was that buyers of coaching in particular think that supervision is where quality assurance is kept because as you know coaching is a confidential endeavor and the buyers of coaching don't actually see what they're buying all they meet is the coach and all they get is something at the end of it telling them whether by the client or the coach whether or not they think the coaching has been successful for most buyers they get to see an awful lot more about what they're actually buying if somebody buys some training for instance they can sit in and watch the trainer deliver it but with coaching you can't do that without massively breaching confidentiality or contracting to allow that to happen. But to most people, that would seem a bit strange. So for buyers, what they really wanted was to know that there was some quality assurance happening in supervision and that the coach was taking things to supervision to make sure that they weren't missing things or that they were getting the best out of the client and that they were working in a way that was ethical and with integrity and that they were skilled at what they were doing. So understanding what your stakeholders are expecting of supervision is important. If you don't have any stakeholders, if you're uh, coaching somebody who is paying for it themselves, having a conversation with them about what they want you to make sure you pay attention to in supervision can also be important. 
but across all four of my uh, research groups, the common ground, and this is also what sits with across all the coaching bodies, is that supervision is seen as a vehicle for coaches to learn and develop. So that, that's the common denominator, if you like, for um, every constituent party and what supervision is for. So my invitation is and request of people is to think about what purpose will supervision best serve for me as a coach and for the people I'm coaching. Yeah, thank you. Mm, 刚刚的问题是, mm. 对于辅导教练辅导和督导的一些目的出于的目的观众就在想就是适配性就是如何我们能够找到最适配我们的教练导师或者是督导呢那其实在就是中国其实不太清楚就是算博士不太清楚中国的情况但是呢在欧洲和
what am I selling? What is the service that I am offering to my clients? And that has changed a lot over the years. So when I first started coaching, I used to coach a lot of middle to senior management people because that matched my level of experience. I then started to be drawn more to working with senior women and have spent a lot of my career working with senior women. I had a period of time where I focused quite heavily on a particular sector. So the, the, this um, all changes over time as you develop and think about how you want to grow your coaching practice. Then thinking about the inputs part of the model, an example that I often quote is as a coach, I used to say frequently, I'm not a therapist. And then I thought, well, I say that a lot, but how can I say with any knowledge that I'm not a therapist when I've never been in therapy and gone through that process? So for um, a couple of years, I decided to take on a therapist and work with a therapist so that I understood what that work entailed and how that was very different from coaching work. So I was able to very um, fully and with integrity tell my clients, I am not a therapist and I don't do therapeutic work. So the inputs, throughputs and outputs model really does help you think about what do I need from supervision next? Which of those three areas might it be useful for me to focus on? And that then helps you think about the type of supervisor that you need to support you with that great that, great that makes sense? yeah 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 sure um 刚刚就是, uh 三博士补充了一点就是帮助我们如何找到适合自己的就是读导或者是教练的时候他就是引用了自己在就是自己的演讲当中的三个观念一个是input 一个是throughput 一个是output 那么就是教练投入一个是教练能力一个是教练产出 那刚刚他以自己的亲身经验作为经历啊，给大家讲讲啊，就是详细阐述啊这个问题，就是刚刚他就是从啊职业初期的时候，他其实特别注重的是啊关于throughput，那就是啊教练能力的一些就是啊学
um, very important uh, terms uh, in your slides. It, one is uh, hand sight, the second one is insight, the third one is foresight. So um, there's a question about foresight. So mm -hmm. foresight, uh, there's a saying, uh, first impressions maybe are strongest. So uh, for example, if one client uh, is searching for the internet uh, because this is the first time uh, he received the coaching services, so um, suddenly uh, he, uh, he saw a news uh, alerts and bad news about coaching period, about uh, coaching uh, supervision. So, uh, so the next time uh, when he come into the coaching session, maybe he will uh, uh, will be with doubts, uh, questions to uh, the coaches and to the uh, coaches. So, um, do you have that kind of uh, experience? And how do you deal with that kind of uh, foresight and first impression? Mm, interesting. So. I think often one of the things that um, isn't given enough attention in an organization is to ensure that the coaching client is ready for coaching. So there's a lot of focus, um, certainly in Europe and, and the US, put on ensuring that coaches are trained, that they are accredited, they're in supervision. So there's a lot of expectations put on coaches to make sure that they are fit for purpose. A lot of organizations do not put the same scrutiny on the coaching client. And of course, a coaching assignment can only be as successful as the combination of the coach and the client. So making sure that the client is in uh, the right mindset to be coached, that coaching is actually the right intervention. I mean, often uh, I can, I've had many clients sit in front of me who've been sent to coaching and actually they don't need coaching. They need some training or some mentoring um, or they need some time out. So coaching is not the answer to every development or learning or performance issue. Um, also with clients, if they come with a first impression, when you first meet them, talking about that is important. I think it's uh, in a first meeting with a client, I will often ask them what assumptions they have about coaching, what experience they have of coaching, what reputation coaching has in their organization or amongst their peers and colleagues. So that at least what we can do is surface what some of those topics are and either challenge them directly to say, and when I say challenge, I don't mean argue, I mean explore where they've come from, whether or not they're appropriate, um, so that you have a, a very um, adult conversation about what each other are expecting. So... First impressions, everybody will have them. Everybody will have a first impression. Mm -hmm. The trick here, I think, is to surface what those first impressions are and check whether or not they're accurate. Does that answer the question, Min? Yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. The third uh, 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 他可能在第一次就是迈入教练辅导时
，告诉客户们，首先你要准备好了，有没有准备好接受这个辅导？那这个是非常重要的，因为在市场上面，就很多的教练呢、啊，啊，导师啊，还有督导，他们其实都是，嗯。就是在欧美啊，他他们都是非常严格的标准去训练的，然后去啊拿到证书等等的。但是同时，但是呢啊没有对就是教练客户啊没有对接受教练的那一批人同样进行啊嗯、啊、对于同样的标准去要求他们，让他们有意识去就是准备好接受教练服务。其实教练辅导等等，它其实是一个共赢的一个啊一个过程，需要双方互相的就是互动。啊，要互相的去，就是乐于去接受。那所以说啊，就要有客户要有这样的心态和这种思想，要接受啊。其实有时候，嗯，当然就是有时候在组织当中，有些就是啊，利益相关者他会为自己的员工去啊啊购买一些教练服务。当然，有些人他是不需要的，他会觉得他这是一种侵入，这是一种干预啊，是不良干预。所以说，其实啊，对于这样的情况，我们要了解到，不是。教练不是能够解决所有的问题的。那有些人他需要的是教练，有些人他需要的是导师，所以说就不能够混为一谈。那是如果以后遇到这样的情况啊，就是啊，通常呃、啊、最好是直接说出来。他会问就是接受呃教练辅导的那些就是客户啊，您对于教练辅导的就是一些设想是什么？那您的期待是什么？那您以前有没有接触过教练辅导？那您对于教练辅导是怎么看待的呢？那从您身边或者是从您周围的朋友，又是对教练辅导怎么看待的呢？啊，如此、啊、他去了解到就是啊，就是教练辅导在他内心中的一些啊，就是想法。同时他也会挑战他们。当然，这种挑战所说的是挑战，而不是啊去批判或者是去与人家就是啊有啊口舌的一些就是。呃，就是一些辩论，而是挑战啊。这种挑战呢，其实是一种成年人之间的对话，就是各自把各自的期望啊，就是放在台面上啊，就是真实的提出来啊，然后不断的去啊，反复的核核对啊，反复的核实，然后互相达到共赢的一个阶段。Ma'am, can I add to that answer, please? Yes, sure. Yeah, sure. So I've answered the question about. What, how to manage the first impressions of、mm -hmm. the client?、Mm -hmm. Where supervision can help you as a coach in foresight is to think about what assumptions you might be holding about the client or about、mm -hmm. the coaching work that you're going to do. So, by talking with a supervisor, you can unpack and explore. What assumptions you might be having or holding about the work you're about to do. So, if I give an example, it could be that you、um, you know that your client works in a a big、um, engineering organization. So you might hold some assumptions about what being a leader in a big manufacturing organization means. What goes in that sector. Or it might be as、um, the the question originally came from that you've read something about、um, the client that you're going to be working with, either seen something on LinkedIn or you've seen something、um, in the newspaper or、um, whatever, but whatever it might might be. So as coaches, we're not immune to having assumptions and to having bias.、Um, so it's important that in supervision we have those checked. And that's a way of ensuring that you're working ethically, is that making sure as a coach you've thought through: Am I going into this coaching assignment with a, a honestly open mind, without any judgment about my client, so that I'm leaving an open space for them to be able to do their bring their best self, and you can do your best work as a, a coach, as opposed to the, allowing the interference of. Unchecked assumptions or biases to inform what you do. Yeah. 嗯，关于这个问题，第三个问题进一步的解释啊，添加到了一些关于就是刚刚啊讲座主题的啊道德观念的方面啊，关于就是教练是如何处理第一印象先入为主的呢？啊
啊、呃，就是我们除了就是对啊、呃、顾客要进行不断的核核对啊、呃，不断的就是去。验证，同时呢，我们还要就是对于教练本身他自己持有的一些观念，对客户提啊持有的观念要不断的去啊反复的去核对啊，比如说啊嗯啊，比如说啊有一个客户，他可能是在一个大型的啊工程啊就是公司工作的啊，那可能就是这位教练他可能会对他持有啊一些设想啊，他就是可能他不知道。啊，在一个制造业啊，作为就是领导是什么样的一个状态啊，需要什么样的帮助等等等等，他可能就会从领英或者是报纸啊，身边朋友等等去，就是听到了一些关于这个呃大工程的大工程公司的一些啊啊一些报道啊等等一些消息，所以说其实啊那个教练他也是不可避免的，就是嗯、啊、有会有存在一些啊啊第一印象。所以说啊，那教练同时也要就是不可松懈的去不断的去啊 check， 不断的去验证自己有哪一些的，就是呃、啊啊、一些啊啊设想，有一些设想啊，同时呢要保证自己就是用最好的啊方式、工作方式和工作态度啊去就是带给客户，要就是要诚实啊，要公开公要公开公正，同时不要带着任何的评价。啊，没有，就是没有评价，去就是和客户达到一个啊共赢的啊，在一个公开就是自由的啊，然后安全的啊辅导环境中去啊，就是解决一些问题。Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Sam. So, ah.、Uh, I think it's uh it's twelve o'clock in your country. Now it's eleven o'clock. Eleven o'clock, yes. Yeah, it's long. Yeah, it's eleven o'clock. So, so hope you have a very uh good lunch. Thank you. Yeah. And so thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my research. Um, and I wish you all the very best. Thank you so much. Ah,、uh, thank you so much. Yeah. So, so due to the time limit, so it's ah、uh, let's ah、uh, call it a day. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, so Susan. Yep. Do you have any question for、uh, Doctor Sam? So, you... uh, actually, this is、uh, my first time to to attend this. So,、yeah. um, I'm a really new camera in this regard. So, I、uh, I just uh one maybe still still paid question.、Uh, yeah. I still. No, what's the difference be between coach and? Mentor and all, all, all you mentioned the supervision. Oh, I I don't have any idea in this for this topic. Okay, okay. okay. So, coaching and mentoring have very similar skills. So the、uh, mm. the coach and mentor will ask lots of questions. Will do lots of listening. What is typically different is that. A mentor will often know what the answer is because they have the experience of having done what the, their mentee is asking about. So, if I,、mm. for instance, wanted to learn about、um, how to do great business development, I might pick a mentor who、mm. is who has a reputation and experience for doing. Fantastic business development.、Mm -hmm. A coach, on the other hand,、mm -hmm. will facilitate you coming up with a solution to something. So often in coaching, there absolutely is not a right answer. There's not a truth.、Um, there are many, many ways that something could be progressed. So if I say I want to be a good leader. There isn't one right answer to that. 
So I could mm. choose to work with a mentor who will say, well, this is how I did it, Sam. I used to do this. Why don't you try doing this? Why don't you try doing that? A coach, on the other hand, will encourage you to think about, well, what type of leader would you like to be? What are the sorts mm -hmm. of things that you would like to do as a leader? So they facilitate you coming up with your own answer as opposed to a mentor who will tell you what they think the answer is. Does that make sense about the difference between coaching and mentoring, Susan? Yes, generally. Okay. Uh, I, 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 I and get a basic and understand. But uh, another further question, I mean, a short question. Um, if if a mentor mentor is familiar with something, but uh, they have to be in certain industry or something. No one understand all yes. all, all the industry, so ha have to specialize in certain industry, right? Yes, absolutely. Whereas a coach doesn't, oh. because the coach doesn't know the answer. Mm -hmm. They just need to have a process. yeah. yeah technique a way of facilitating the other person so I've coached lots hundreds of people and I couldn't do their job mm -hmm. I don't know how to do their job um, I don't understand half of what they do in their job but that doesn't mean I can't coach them really efficiently because what I'm doing is getting them to work through their thinking and their experience other resources that they can pull in to think about how they can make some shifts in what they want to do okay right understood thank you you're welcome and then just to finish a supervisor um, mentors don't have supervisors, but coaches do. And a supervisor is a bit like a coach for the coach. So you will have some supervisors who will be more directive and make some suggestions and offer opinions or advice. And other supervisors who will be more facilitative. Um, but the, the idea of a supervisor is to help you learn, grow and develop your coaching practice. Got it. Yeah, so let's uh let let me interpret those questions and answers. Uh, 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 so uh Gang uh, 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 啊，导师之间是有相似之处的，因为他们都通过发问和聆听啊，来就是进行辅导和就是指导工作。那关于导师呢，他其实是啊，对于就是被辅导的对象，他是知道啊，是根据自己的经验啊，知道的东西能够
Yeah, so thank you very much, Susan, and thank you very much for your patience, uh, Dr. Sen. So, thank you for having me, man. Yeah, we, we, we must uh, um, go to the end. Yeah, so next I will uh, give some advertisements about EMCC. So uh, you can stay in the Zoom or you can have a rest. So I will uh, contact you later uh, via email about the data and the later things. I, that's excellent. Thank you so much, men. I'll leave Thank you to you it. So much. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.非常感谢大家今天就是啊来聆听我们的讲座啊，那刚刚这位啊散博士他也是欧洲导师教练协会国际认证的导师，是大师级的导师。所以如果啊您对就是从事导师职业感兴趣，或者是获得导师认证感
是 UCM 组织心理学博士，也是欧洲导师与教练协会啊大师级导师和教练。同时呢，他是一名作家、诊断工具的作者、顾问培训师和团队教练。所以大家如果平时对就是网上就是十六型人格 MBTI 等等感兴趣啊，那可以就是啊就是微信关注一下 Mentoring Co 导师学院，预约下一场预告。好，今天的讲座就到这里结束了，感谢您的聆听，请您留下宝贵的建议。